is the juice worth the squeeze to put tile in? Um, I'd ask how much does it cost to put tile in? If you don't have tile to start with and it costs you $1,500 an acre to put it in, are you going to reap $1,500 of benefit if you sold it right after that? Ladies and gentlemen, farmers, ranchers, and distinguished guests. Thank you for listening to the Farm for Profit podcast, where we discuss the latest ideas, methods, trends, and techniques available to help your farm achieve higher levels of farm profitability. The Farm for Profit podcast is co-hosted by Tanner Winterhoff, the Iowa Bankerman, and David Whitaker, the Iowa Land Guy, where in tandem, they will share their ideas and advice from industry experts. Thank you again for listening to the Farm for Profit podcast. Remember, if you aren't farming for profit, you won't be farming for long. And now, here's Tanner and David. And listeners, welcome back to the Farm for Profit podcast. This is Tanner Winterhoff. And this is David Whitaker. And we've got Corey joining us just a little bit later, but we wanted to jump in and get you started off early. Remember, this is a Farm for Profit show. We have our farm for profit format where we do a what's working in ag segment followed by a general topic to help your farm achieve higher levels of profitability day. And thanks again to all the people that suggested topics for our podcast. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Remember to send them to farm, the number four profit LLC at gmail.com and like rate review us on social media. We'd love to connect. Yeah, we love that. That's exactly how this podcast is grown. That's where we get our content from. And that's why we're headed into this show again today. It's a continued listener feedback episode. But most importantly, we need to recognize you listeners. Today, our listener review is brought to you by BW Fusion. They are combining best-in-class products along with their 365 soil and tissue program to provide you, the grower, the tools necessary to identify the limiting factors in your farm. So they're out there, Dave, helping us boost that ROI on our farm. What's our listener review this week? Well, it came from Robert Bray. Uh, listen to all of your episodes. Now, that's fantastic to uh -huh. start with. I like listen that. to all of your episodes. What is there, 200 uh, out we're, there? We're up there. Yeah, that's a lot of time. That's a lot of time. Listen to all of your episodes, and they are quite entertaining. Remember, you can now review us on Spotify as That's well, right. but thank you, Robert Bray. Appreciate yes. that. Awesome. Now it's time for that What's Working in Ag segment that I told you about early on. So we are here today blessed with the presence of Craig Lee. Craig Lee is the Director of Sales for North America for Gearinghoff. Welcome, Craig. Well, thanks for having me. So why don't you tell our listeners just a little bit more about yourself, and then we'll get into it. Okay. Well, uh, again, my name is Craig Lee. I've uh, been with Gearinghoff about four years, I'm currently the director of sales for North America. I work with about eight other territory managers across the country uh, and a dealer network of uh, probably around 450 or so uh, dealer locations, fairly well represented uh, from uh, Colorado uh, to the Atlantic Ocean. So basically, uh, that's kind of my story with Gearinghoff, I've uh, been in the equipment business about 25 years, uh, primarily in the retail end of things. Uh, I worked with a couple different brands of dealerships. And uh, prior to working with Gearinghoff at the manufacturer level, I was a, a retail salesman for the product. So I've got quite a bit of experience uh, with the product uh, and working with it uh, at the farm level as well. So uh, I live in East Central Illinois, a little town called Wellington, Illinois. It's about 30 miles north of Danville and uh, grew up on a family farm. Uh, my dad farmed for about 50 years, three miles from where I live. Uh, he retired seven years ago and uh, rented out to a cousin of mine. And uh, I went uh, the direction uh, of the equipment business. So, Craig, if you've worked in, in equipment business, you sound like you had a pretty impressive career. Help me understand, what brought you to Gearinghoff and now you're you know, working for them, what, what made them so special that drew your attention that direction? Right. Well, um, Gearing Hop, you know, uh, as I started out in retail and worked for a couple different dealerships and lots of different brands and, and did get to be, uh, you know, there's several good manufacturers out there, but uh, always kind of wanted to get in and be a manufacturer's rep and, um, you know, wanted to represent a product that I believed in and that, that had quality and uh, had, had a company background that had the same values as I did. And, you know, Gehringhoff has been in the same family since 1880. It was founded in 1880. It's 142 years old. It's on the fifth generation. It's still family owned. And, you know, it has uh, kind of a, the best of a, a big, big company feel, but yet a small company feel. And, 
And I, I think that's really kind of what drew me to it as much as anything. So in your position, you come across a lot of different growers. What is working for the farmers right now? Well, in, in terms of the Gearing Hawk product line, I guess uh, I would say, you know, we probably have more configurations uh, of, you know, first of all, we specialize, you know, we're a specialty company. We have dealt in nothing but harvest equipment for 142 years and, and primarily header equipment. And our goal is to make whatever combine you have behind our head work better. So we have probably more configurations than anyone else out there, not only in terms of widths of heads, but number of rows. You know, we can build a head from two rows to 32 rows, from six foot wide to 60 foot wide. You know, we have three or four different processing systems, uh, depending on what level of residue you need uh, to come out with, or, um, you know, if you have different tillage practices, uh, we have a head that probably uh, can be suited for your operation. So that's kind of the strength of Gearinghoff as I see it. And Craig, the, the reason for having so many different configurations is at Gearinghoff, you guys saw that that helped people be more productive. So more productive or do a better job uh, with whatever their situation is, which in tune, uh, Tanner, I'm going to argue that's what's working. It must be working if they've been doing it so long. Yeah. And if it's working, the only reason anybody spends money is because it's it's working and it's making them more money. I'm guessing that's what your clients are seeing is they're seeing uh, more productivity or more uh, uh, rate of return, uh, ROI. Right. And, and, you know, I guess when you ask what's working, uh, you know, that's a really hard question to answer because uh, what works down in the Delta may not work up in the Dakotas. Yep. And, you know, when some of the other manufacturers basically uh, have one style of head, I guess, you know, they're locked in to where that thing may work in one situation and not in the other. Now, we may have that situation, too, if you were to take just one model and take it from north to south, let's say. But because we have so many different varieties and different configurations, we can kind of match a head to the conditions and feel that that's one of our strengths. Well, Craig, I know I was I was looking at it. You just talked about the Delta to the Dakotas. Even in Iowa, Tanner, you go to Western Iowa to the lowest hills, uh, the topography is completely different. Having sold farmland all over Iowa, there is square flat and black, and then there is super hilly ground. One of the things that I was looking at was the adaptive flex technology. And it doesn't matter if it's a 12 row head or a 16 row head. Um, if you look at the pictures on the website, that thing is like <laughs> bending. I mean, it like moves. Yeah, we talked about, Craig, on this podcast before your razor heads. So your right. your draper head and how much flex those have for going over terraces. And I don't think we realized at that time that your corn headers also have the same similar type of technology. Well, you know, you're not alone in not realizing that because it is fairly new. Uh, we just introduced it at the Farm Progress Show uh, this past summer uh, there in Decatur. You know, we've been working with it for a few years, but it is the first head from a manufacturer that, that can flex, uh, you know, the day you get it. So, hmm. you know, we're, we're kind of pulling off of the, the drapers and the platforms. Those have flexed for years. And as the corn heads get bigger and bigger as we get into these 12, 16, you know, 24s next, that thing really probably isn't going to work the best in all conditions if it's just totally rigid. So we came with the, the AFT and the Adaptive Flex technology and the frame. Currently, we're offering it just in a 12 and a 16 row configuration, uh, but we'll, we'll make it into 18s and 24s and, and uh, you know, as the market needs. But it really just has a tremendous amount of flex that for the hillier terrains, the terrace situations. You know, just give you an example that the 12 row flexes a total of about 50 inches from top to bottom. Uh, a 16 row flexes around 68 inches. So it's really pretty neat to, to see what that thing can do. Dave, that's, that's more inches than you are tall. It is. That's like 10 degrees. That's, that's <laughs> crazy. That's a hillside. So still one of my favorite YouTube videos that I stumbled across was that header that you custom built for the Nexat combine over in Ukraine. That thing is right. massive. And obviously that 
the technology will come to that size of a head. But this has been fun to watch the videos around this because it pivots in the middle, correct? If I if I'm understanding, right. and then it'll flex up like a smile, or it'll flex down like a like a frown, correct? It, well, it, yes, it will. But uh, you know, the the wings are independent. So uh, we, if you had a situation to where it needed to be, you know, both up and both down, we could sure do that. But you might have a situation where one needs to go up, one needs to go down, and and we can do that as well too. So it, it works off of a. A multi-sensor system uh, that was developed in conjunction with HeadSight, which we use on uh, all of our corn heads for our header height control, and, and that's worked worked very well. I got a question, just separate from this. Will that thing fold all the way up so you can drive down the road and not have the width? Well, we get asked that a lot, and and you would think that it would, but essentially, right now we're taking a 12 or a 16 row rigid frame mm -hmm. and then making it flex. Gotcha. So we, we do have folding corn heads, so we can give you a 12 or a 16 row folder or a 12 or a 16 row flex. The next step of course is to get it to do both. So, I mean, that is a goal of ours. I would say probably sooner than later, we will see that. Uh, but for 2022, uh, we do not have it flex and fold. You get a choice. Technology is fascinating, Dave. That'll be here before we know it. And uh, I was curious, so I'm glad that you asked the You heard it here also. first. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> uh, but that's that's neat. So this technology, if I picked it up right, will work with your North Star, your North Star XDC, and your Roto Disc heads, correct? Yes. Uh, it uh, really, you know, several different processing systems, as long as they're a 12 row 30 or a, a, a 16 row 30, we can do different things with that. Nice. So this adaptive flex technology is specifically designed for maximizing the yield potentials when harvesting your corn in hilly or terraced conditions. So Craig, thanks again for joining us during this What's Working in Ag segment. If somebody wants to learn more about this, where should they go to check it out? Well, you can certainly go to, uh, to garinghoff.com or uh, you can visit your local dealer and uh, they could perhaps even facilitate a meeting between uh, the farmer and a territory manager or, or Garing Hoff representative, uh, if you'd like to to get really in depth, um, uh, there's a dealer locator on GaringHoff.com as well. So if you're not really sure where to go, uh, check that out, and uh, someone can sure help you out. Awesome! And you guys will be set up at the National Farm Machinery Show in in Louisville, Kentucky, correct? We will be, and we'll actually be a little closer to you even before that uh, and be at the Iowa Ag Expo there. Awesome. There you go. Guys, listeners, gals, everybody out there, check out Gearing Hoff if you wouldn't mind. Craig, we appreciate the partnership with the Farm for Profit podcast. We appreciate your time on the show. Well, thanks for giving us the opportunity. They're minimizing risks on your farm. Helping you improve your yields and increasing your profit margins. In today's farming operations, the data is the key to achieving all of this, Dave. It's no secret that data has been helping more and more farmers gain ground in their operation. And there's no better way to manage all of that data than through John Deere's Operation Center. As a leading farm management platform, John Deere is constantly and continuously fine tuning the features in Operation Center to make it easier, faster for you to analyze all of that farm data. Yeah, and within that operations center, you can collect and analyze all of your machine, field, and crop data year after year, so you can make those data-driven decisions for your operation. You can set up field instructions for your machine operators, then push those instructions directly to that in-cab display straight from that operations center. Then your operators don't have to enter this information when they get to the field. That is so cool. And with near real-time monitoring with the operations center, you can track the machine performance, the field work, and stay ahead of all the logistics to ensure the right work is being done at the right time. With all that yield data in operations center, you can analyze your farm, your total farm operations performance and make any changes for an even better next year. And John Deere continues to make their operations centers your go-to place to gain ground in your operation. It's free to use. Just create an account at operationscenter.deer.com or download the mobile apps from the Apple app or Google Play stores. You can also see your local John Deere dealer for more information. Thank you to John Deere for being a proud partner of the Farm for Profit podcast. Awesome. Listeners, let's move right into part two of our tile episode. So remember, 
we are going to uh, continue to tell you about ways that Tile is going to help your farm achieve higher levels of profitability. And we're going to go a couple of different avenues in part two here away from maybe what you think of in the sheer yield and production side and maybe think outside the box. So, Corey, why don't you ant, uh, introduce our guest that we have here for our second show? So we got our guest here. We actually have two guests, but uh, one's just a grandstander in the background. <laughs> but our main guest for this show is Randy, and he goes by the Master Pipe Layer on Instagram. And uh, you guys might know him from uh, uh, the podcast Off the Husk. And so let me just read this intro that Tanner has written up for him since it's not my personal uh, one that I wrote. Randy manages a drain tile company currently after working in the dairy farming, custom harvesting, spraying, fertilizing, and even building grain handling equipment. At 19 years old, he joined the local fire department, giving back to his community a second nature to Randy. Randy relies on this variety of experience when he co-hosts Off the Husk, the podcast. Started in October of 2019 with a mission to become a national voice for agriculture. So what do you call that? An advocate? An advocate. Okay. When he's not working, he spends time with his wife and two boys. Are you ever not working? I was just, you guys really did your research here. I'm impressed. Yeah. Welcome, awesome. welcome to the show, Randy. Okay. Uh, I just, I guess, did all the research for that Tanner yeah. dug up on you. So how are you doing? Good. Do you want to introduce your, your guest that is just kind of hanging out in the background? Yeah, he usually tags along to a lot of these things, yep. grandstands. But uh be Zach Johnson. You might also know him as the a golfer. Yeah, okay. yeah professional <laughs> golfer on the <laughs> side. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. When he's not golfing, he carries around a goofy camera. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> and the goofy camera is here today. <laughs> also known as a millennial farmer. Yeah. Okay. Right. Who, who gave me the name Master Pipe Player? Oh, okay. no, he did. Ah. So, so if you go way back in his videos, there was the first one he ever did with me doing drain tile. And he had popped up just uh, just a text, the Master Pipe Player. And it, it's, <laughs> it's still it's long from there. Yep. So well, I, fe I felt I needed to label him as some sort of a professional because we were doing <laughs> this show on drain tile. So the first time he was on talking to the camera i put it over to the side like this is randy nesman master pipe layer <laughs> well that's all we do is bring experts here for our audience so i'm glad that you named him as an expert so he could come on our podcast right. otherwise we'd probably not get this opportunity <laughs> correct yeah yeah they wouldn't have pulled all that up from the internet no nope. <laughs> what was your name before the master pipe layer um randy <laughs> <laughs> gotcha well you guys are in the studio today and you're heading somewhere where are you heading we are heading to omaha oh okay Ben from Farm Focus, he does all the apparel for a lot of the agricultural social media guys. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we wanted to get there and do some stuff with him, and and there's a steakhouse down there we want oh, to Oh, man. Yeah. That's worth the trip any day of the week. Yep. All right, we better get this done and out of the way with so they can get back on the road. <laughs> so, uh, listeners, remember, drain tile, that's a system of pipes with perforations or not, holes to channel the water away from certain intended areas. We talked about this tubing or pipe being buried in the ground that was our 101 episode and we're going to get a little bit deeper today right dave yeah, you bet and one of the things that we were going to do was uh, go more to the investment side and how you can become profitable from uh, putting in field tile we kind of uh, hedged away from that in the first episode just to give you the basics of why when where who what how and now maybe more the money side so tanner you're going to be big on this one as of well course. as as well as the master pipe player of course so <laughs> Our two guest experts that we had on in the first show, Randy, were from Iowa, and they laid a bunch of pipe in central, wouldn't you call it? Probably the central region yeah, of the state. Yeah. So you're going to have some more experience from up in the Minnesota area, correct? Correct, yeah. Have you laid any tile in other states, or has it pretty much been in your area? We're not real far from South Dakota, so I, I do get into South Dakota a little bit. Um, I didn't this year, but typically I'll get one or two jobs just across the border. And so what uh, the two guys that we had on earlier, they uh, um, both had bigger machines. We talked about local farmers using tile, and Corey, you have a tile plow. What uh, Give us a little preface. Like I'm, I'm curious myself. What, what kind of operation, um, employees that work for you, do you put a lot in every year? How big a machinery, et cetera? Well, probably should start back up a little bit. So we also farm. Okay. So the two guys I work for, and then I've slowly started working into it a little bit. Uh, so they farm. We farm about 5,000 acres. Oh, boy. Okay. So then back in the day when they first started getting into it, like 96, I think they bought the first plow, 96, 98. It was a, it was a mounted plow, um, a Wayne's mounted plow on a, on a T tractor, John Deere T. And then through the years, we upgraded to a 
trench or a chain digger for doing mains. And then we're doing the small stuff with the tractor one. And then just, we went to a commercial plow, another commercial plow, another commercial plow. <laughs> so, so you're running a commercial plow now. What What is the machine so you're running So currently now? now we're running an Interdrain 2050 okay. uh, GP, the double link. So the guys had earlier said that the, uh, the wheeled machines, the trencher machines, aren't the way to go anymore. They had a time, they had a slot, but right now they're not nearly as efficient as what we have in these plows. Right. So the, the chain digger that we had, uh, that sits right now in northern Iowa. And certain ground types, it, it really goes in. It doesn't like rocks, and it doesn't like really gumbo clay. Hmm. We'd actually get to a point where we would bring water out in a water trailer to spray the chain. Otherwise, the chain would just rope up. Oh. Basically, the cutters wouldn't clean out. Hmm. So it was just like a big rope dragging through the dirt, and you just, you just didn't move. So then up in your area, we had kind of alluded to the different tile plat patterns that are typically used uh, in our previous episode, but didn't really get very deep into that. So what, what is typical in your area? Is everything pattern tiled or is there other designs? We probably about that 2010, 2011, and then we started to see some pattern tiles popping up. And then, and then that's when we started doing some of our own. So we usually try to do like one quarter of ours a year, and then the rest is all custom. We do everything from replacing old concrete mains to uh, there's still a lot of random tile goes on. And then we, we've been getting more and more into the tile stuff or the, or the pattern stuff. Yep. Because it sounds like that's more where uh, the efficiency comes in is when you can come in, unload wants, and take, knock out an 80 or 120. Correct. Yep. yep. The, the lay of our land is more of a, uh, um, I mean, we have a lot of hills, a lot of draws, watersheds this way, that way. So, so we don't typically get on nice, you know, 2,000 foot runs. They're usually 500 foot runs. So still have a whole maze of sub mains throughout this corridor. And then, and then so a pattern. Are you guys there. using uh, drainage districts? I'm and just going to ask the same question. Do you guys have that? Some like of Iowa? everything. We do have some county um, tiles. We have some county ditches that we run into, but most of it is private. So Zach, is that the same in your area? Kind of a drainage district type region, or? It, well, I don't. Do we have drainage districts? So R Randy's about an hour west of where where we farm actually. So and Randy's never. Well, he closed the ditch for us once, but you've never done an actual tile job. Right. Yep. So you don't have an actual watershed over in your area. It all just gets ran through the county. Yeah. Um, there. Nice. I don't know that there's any county tiles or mains over there. There's enough creeks and creeks and ditches and which it's sounds not like private. sounds like it's to your advantage. What we learned last time is when you have to deal with a district, then you have stuff that's out mm -hmm. of your control. Sometimes you have to pay for a main that gets fixed, not even on your farm, based upon your drainage district and how that works out. So, yep. It also, I've seen it be an advantage too when something needs to get done. <clears throat> you know, so one ditch is used by 10 guys and this ditch needs to be cleaned or needs some maintenance. Five of those guys don't want to do anything. Well, this way here, they can go through, they'll assess it back to your taxes right. and then pay for it over the 10 years. I know get, one drainage ditch up here by Kelly. I think it, I can't remember how long it runs, but it needed dredged. And it was like a million dollar bid. I mean, to dredge that yeah. many miles. So I, that's I a sold a farm uh, about three months ago in Hamilton County, and there was uh, uh, encumbrance, would be the word on it. The county assessor had already put that they were going to dredge the whole thing, and whether you lived in that area or you were buying farmland in that area, or in my case, selling it, it had to go there, and you had a uh, special assessment assessed to it. And mm -hmm. it was going to work out to about $100 an acre. What's the definition of that word? What's that? Encumbrance? Yeah, I've, uh, I've mean, never heard of it. <laughs> encumbrance means uh, something that would be uh, money owed against. Okay. Yeah, secured by. Secured by. Yeah. So I was going to guess it was an old wooden ship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's well, a good guess. Then we get into encroachments, all kinds of stuff. I digress. Here we go. Back to pipe. So on, on that, going to there, so we, we live right on the continental divide. Mm -hmm. So half our water goes north, half our water goes south. Huh. So that creates a permitting nightmare in its own um, i never even would have thought of that being a limitation i mean not necessarily a limitation but just another factor that you have to, right. to, to <clears> and, plan for and the, the biggest part of that is so i don't know when those watersheds are 50s 60s whatever they were so they came through and just you know this quarter went here this quarter went there this you know by sections and quarters well the water a lot of time is split through the center of that quarter so now you've been paying taxes for your water to go north yeah and actually half of it goes south <laughs> And then they don't want a permit because you're not in that water district. You have the physical, so they call it the physical water and the legal water. 
Well, that's like Uppy down under. His toilet goes the other way, that's right. so he doesn't have to pay taxes when it goes wrong. <laughs> is that a real thing? <laughs> I don't it know. Is. It, it is. That's what is he said. It? Is it? Oh, my yeah. goodness. We interviewed Andrew Uphill from Australia, so that was kind of fun to, to try and coordinate schedules for that show. That was a good one. So did he actually know, or did he have to run to his toilet? To see. No, he, he acted like he just knew right yeah, off the top of his head. He knew that it was. Because I don't know that I could tell you which way ours swirl. <laughs> That's a good I point. Think we swirl it's clockwise. Clockwise. <laughs> clockwise. <ours is. laughs> it's different if you're sitting on it versus standing yeah. over it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or if there's a log jam. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to get to tile maintenance in a minute. Here. <laughs> yeah, beavers aren't very good for uh-huh. a tile. <laughs> So we had talked about in the first show the, the pattern tile, which, you know, most of the time when you see that, it's parallel lines running. But then the other ones that I wanted to hit real quick before we moved on was Herobone. So that'd be basically one main line that runs through the field and others that come into it diagonally Correct. Or, or at an angle. Uh, and then sometimes you lay double mains. I assume that's for those fields that have a lot of moisture issues. Like a parallel double main? I would say that's probably more for just size limitations. Um, you know, you double the flow so you can run water. This main goes this way. This main goes that way. Gotcha. Yeah. And then the one on the last picture in our image says random. You, you don't ever random, really. you don't ever do that, right? <clears throat> yeah. Random. So we've yeah. got anywhere there's a draw, um, depression, you know, things like that. So if I so if I pull up a map to do a random tile job through the use of lidar, so I turn on all the flows. Lidar. Lidar. Um, I think you said liger. They're like <laughs> lion tiger <laughs> there for a little bit. <laughs> it's like liger. It's pretty much my favorite animal. Lidar. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Pretty much my favorite animal. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, LiDAR. Okay, we're back to making maps. <laughs> so the main things I'll look at is, is your flows. So that basically calculates all the watersheds and little watersheds within the sub-watersheds, wherever the water runs, and then the depression. So anywhere there's a little bump. So we're the prairie puddle. Our ground is like a golf ball. So even the top of hills have depressions. So then you would turn on your depressions map, and then through, through hitting all those draws in the depressions, uh, then you can look at some aerial imagery and, and kind of fine-tune it that way. But we're, we're definitely going way more of a pattern style versus a random. I would say random is pretty common in our area. Th- there's not a whole lot of pattern tile stuff in our area because we have a few more draws. And I don't know if we have more ditches or not, but it just seems like random is a lot more common. Yeah, where we're you have at. a lot smaller watersheds, a uh, little more hills. So, Zach, do you just find the wet spot and then try and tile away from the wet spot? Is that kind of, as a farmer, that's what you're doing more? Yeah, pretty much. The wet areas, the draws, you know, whatever we can, that's kind of what we're doing yet. Gotcha. As a farmer, I'm going to ask you, Zach, uh, the last episode, they gave us a number of like how much more you could potentially gain from putting tile. Is tile, tile's huge in Iowa. Is it as big in Minnesota? Huge. Well, at least in my area. Okay. Yeah. As a farmer yourself, are they seeing rate of return off of this? I mean, are they thinking this is something we have to do, or is it better to spend our money like in a new grain bin or something else? In our area, I mean, it's pretty well known or pretty well believed that drain tile is going to be your number one return. It's probably yeah. why it was the number one requested show, Tanner. <laughs> I mean, you had a you had a pretty big drought. I watched a few of your videos last summer. Like you were talking, I, you were racing. I think I watched that. You were had like one inch of rain all summer on a couple farms or something, and you still had pretty good yields, didn't you? It, not bad. Yeah. Uh, a lot better than they should have been because yeah. we had from planting to August 23rd, we had less than two inches right at our farm. And then from August 23rd to mid-November, we had over 20 inches, I believe. Yeah. So, I mean, it all just came at the wrong time. Yeah. But, you know, it, it is what it is. At least we've been kind of replenished. We have a lot of snow right now, too. Okay. A couple, mm-hmm. two, three feet of snow. So one of the questions that we got from our listeners was uh, around what COVID-19 has done to the supply of tile. Have you heard or seen any issues with the supply of either it being manufactured or it being delivered because of transportation? So we worked through a distributor that actually worked out really well, especially this year. So they did all the trucking for the tile. Otherwise, yeah, trucking was an issue. And then the other thing, we took all of our tile in early. The oh, price so you got ahead of it. Yeah. <clears throat> so we ordered, we put our order in in March and had everything pretty well delivered by June. It was kind of a nightmare. We had pipes stacked up everywhere in all these fields, which I don't like to do. But doing that, we were able to lock in the price for March. Um, but, but to do that, we had to take delivery of it. So help me understand, as a tile contractor and farmer, you're saying you bought it all early. Do you like prep your contracts for a certain time of year? Is there a certain time of year that Corey, the farmer, Zach, the farmer should call you and say, hey, 
we're going to be laying uh, whatever thousand feet. And then you're going to say, all right, I got all my farmer bids for this fall. And then I'm going to go get contracts, order all this, put it in their field. Or what's that process look like? Yeah. So I, I'm probably a little different than most. So I do all the layouts in the selling and lining up the permitting. And then I'm also the guy installing it. So I do all that in the winter. So if you call me in July or August, I'm probably just going to say, I'll write your name down, get me shout back in January. You know, I get a list going. But I try to have everything booked through the winter. So, so last year, uh, so I was calling guys, telling them, hey, pipe's going up. You know, they're saying 10% now. Who knows what it'll do? If we want to lock it in, make sure we get it. Let's do that now. And then they all prepaid the tile. So then they prepaid, prepaid the tile. We had it delivered. <laughs> um, so it went pretty smooth for us and actually worked out well because I don't even know where it ended up 80% increase or 70% increase. That's where my question was going to go is what it actually did. So it nearly doubled right. in price. <clears throat> Just about. Yeah. I didn't realize you could actually increase the pipe. <laughs> Just going to let that one lie. <laughs> Yeah, well, that. let's back it up. Before that, though, how does a farmer know how many feet they're going to lay? Do you? How do you go about planning it? Obviously, you sell it, but do oh, you I, sell the plan too? I do a complete drop of it. Yeah, so I do a complete uh, layout. That was the Minnesota draw for draw up, draw draw up, drop drop. drop. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> There's three A's. <laughs> I thought he was dropping the tile on the farm. No, I understand what you're saying. No, not not on the counter, yeah. off the backsplash. Yeah, no, yeah. yep. draw up. You do. You help put the plans together. So we'll, yeah. So I I do the full plan and and then uh, based off of soil types, and uh, that that's kind of where I get my spacings from. Yeah. Uh, your depths are your depths. I mean, I know where we are. The tighter we are, usually we got to be like two point seven, two point eight to stay above our clay line. Otherwise, our tiles will kind of seal off in our heavier ground. Um, but then we'll get out to about sixty foot spacing in places. So so I propose it to them. You know. Yep. Looks good. Sometimes I'll draw a pattern in a random. And then show them the price of this and the price of that and see where we're at. And then basically then here's my estimate. If we do exactly what's on this piece of paper, your bill will be exactly what what this estimate is. You know, if we do more, it'll be more. If we do less, it'll be less. What was the 2.8 you just referred to? I'm, I was a little lost uh, there. Depth. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. What, what tools are you using to create that map? Is there like a special program? Yeah, so we're using uh, ADMS. Uh, GK GK Sales, GK Tech, I think they're called. They're GK out of Fargo. Tech. And that's ADMS. just like a um, drainage and flow, yep. hydraulics um, type. Egg data, um, egg data management system. Egg data? They'll do... Uh, surety mapping systems? Nope. Okay. Because they're out of Fargo, I believe, as well, which is an egg data. Um, a this, lot of chemical applicators use them. Okay. Well, um, this would be like Kelly Sharp, Darren Johnson. Okay. They're the creators of it. And then they have a whole mapping team. Hmm. Um, so, so I can call them and get Nate files. I, I can get uh, uh, LIDAR from them, um, or you can download it yourself through the program. And so, the, the LIDAR is basically the topo or basically your elevations? <laughs> yep. It's a laser. Again, I don't know what it all stands for, but basically they flew over top. The DNR did. Yep. And uh, shot down lasers and, and measured the elevations. I always just figured, you know, if we're, if we're farming with RTK, we're getting elevation <clears throat> like on every pass. I thought you could maybe just import all that data it gets pretty wide though yeah it gets pretty wide and through your draws and, and then uh you still have to go out and check your um your outlets and uh, so you can just go out and from your plan you can just start laying pipe i mean yeah yep yeah. i'll usually lay the whole thing out and then go check my outlets once in a while there will be two three four options but typically in our area you have one option for an outlet mm -hmm. it might be here you might have to go down a mile you know you know somewhere in this corner is your outlet and so when i went to Go ahead. And obviously you have uh, old clay tiles and things of that nature, right? Like, are you fixing those as you go through or how to... Some do do of each. That? Typically, like when we're coming in to redo a quarter, we're, we just go through it all. Most of the time it's to the point. And just abandon it. <clears throat> yeah. We're cold enough up there. It's all frozen enough times that anytime you get a big rain, so it's pressurized, you know, they're cracked from being froze. They just open up and crumble on each other. And we'll still hook on to some of the deep ones. I mean, we've got some some old clay and cement that are 15, 18 feet deep. Oh. And they're, they're perfectly good in that depth. So we'll hook on and use those. Mm -hmm. So if we've got a listener that now understands that tile is the place to put your money, if you've got some to spend and they're, they're ready to start collecting on their return on investment for this, how, how would they start? Would they just reach out to the tile contractor and place the call? Is there somebody else that can be doing some of the mapping 
work ahead of you, or is it better for the contractor to do the mapping? Usually just, yep, uh, right to the contractor. I just, I usually will tell them, send me the legal description of what you're, what you've got. If I'm not in front of my computer, I put it down and then I'll, uh, um, a lot of times when I first pull it up, I'll give them a call back just to kind of understand what they got going on there. So Randy, when I sell farmland, every farmer that I know normally has an opinion of how we should sell it, how we should do it, what it's worth, etc. Right. I'm assuming that your guys probably have an opinion of what, where the tile needs, where the main line is. How do you work with the farmers there? And should our farmer listeners just bite their lip and bide their time and trust the professional? Or should they, do you like them to give input? Some of each. Um, a lot of times I like to uh, kind of feel out, you, you're looking for a random, a pattern, you know, what kind of, what are you looking to spend or, or, or what are we doing here? You know, a complete workup. I'd like to just draw it up and then show it and then work through some and of And then work changes. through some of the changes. Yeah, Got because it. a lot of times the main's going to go where it's going to, in our area anyways, the main's going to go where the main's going to go because that's, that's just the way, the way the land lays and everything else, you know. Um, we can shift some things around. We can move some spacings. Sometimes they might want them at a little of angle. Typically, we don't have a whole lot of say in that just because you know, we kind of got to follow that contour. That was uh, another one of the questions that had come from our <laughs> listeners. Corey, do you have anything else before I jump into the next listener question around tile maintenance? No, that's where I was going to go. Oh, go right ahead. Uh, my question was, what's the biggest problem with maintenance of tile or what you see after you? I think I know the answer, but I guess let's hear it from your perspective. Like on a, on a new install? Yeah. <coughs> or you can do new and then you can do old too. Typically on the new ones, I mean, if everything's installed correctly, we don't have a whole lot of issues with them other than keeping your outlets clean. We still use steel outlet pipes. We get a lot of ditches get burned, and, and they'll rust out. You know, 30 years from now, the bottom will get rusted out. But a lot of times, it'll still do what it's supposed to be doing, you know. But um, rodent guards are important in the outlet part. Uh, we'll get muskrats crawling. Usually, they'll crawl up to a T or something, then they'll eat the whole T out. I don't yeah, know if they're trying really? to turn around or what the hell they're doing. Yeah, but, we've had raccoons go up before, and you find them a quarter mile up in the field. Really? Yeah, wow. yeah it's stuck in the pipe. Yeah. Yep. Obviously, on a dry year like this. Walking. Yeah. You don't realize it until it gets wet again. Right. And then you got a problem. Yep. Some of the other callbacks we'll get is is if there was some old clay out there, uh, there'll be some suck holes that'll show up. You know, a lot of times we'll go out and check them, and it's it's that old clay line is, is just kind of filling. You know, we've ripped through it 100 times, and mm -hmm. it's just filling up, and, and, that, and that'll quit. So when uh, farmers are saying that they're, they have broken tile that needs fixed, is it most likely the older clay tile? I don't, I don't think we've ever fixed like a, a plastic, yeah. unless it was something where it got installed too close to maybe a, a draw and it washed it out, mm -hmm. you know, okay. things like that. But otherwise, unless a rodent had eaten it, um, you know, if it's mm -hmm. in there deep enough, you know, tillage isn't going to hit it and things like that. And we had a spot that because of the fall and where it was in the <clears throat> vicinity and the traffic, it got crushed essentially and yep. just regular single wall tile wasn't good enough we had to what install double wall or something like that and because it was getting ran over by manure now that's wagons. something we didn't talk about the other day so there's double wall is there a triple wall i think there's just nope um wall. uh yeah they, they don't call it a triple wall but um there's a few companies that make a I remember what they call it but it, it's more for uh um commercial uh, okay like, like streets and things like that and it's it's actually the same strengthness as as cement so guys are using it for culverts. Oh, like a culvert. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yep. Well, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but the, the double wall isn't really that much stronger. Um, I mean, it is a little bit. It's more just that it's smooth inside, yeah. so you get a lot more flow. Yeah. So, Zach, when you've had to fix tile on your farm, what's been the most common reason? We've had some issues with tree roots. We get too close to fence lines or groves, or there's. we get to the end of the field, and it's got to continue draining. It'll go through somebody's grove. And we've had problems with that mm -hmm. to where we start tearing it up and pulling it out and the tree roots get in there and they just spread till they plug that thing tight. Right. So there's no more resistance. They just go the easy path. Yeah. Right. Right. So you just talked about your neighbor's fields. Uh, now I got a whole new question. If your neighbor, if, did, I'm assuming that drain tile might run through a neighbor's field. What's, what's, I, I don't know the law on this guys. What's the rule? Who fixes it? Does the farmer who's using the tile or does the neighbor, the tile runs through their ground? Typically, they'll work together, but on, on all the new stuff, I try to get them to do a, a drainage easement. That way, it just protects both sides of it. You know, 50 years from now, who knows who's going who's gonna to own that? And uh, 
we run a lot of mains across neighbors, you know, so it's it's completely the neighbor's main running across somebody else's. So if there's an issue out there, it's his to fix. Hmm. Um, so if you run a main across the neighbors, can they connect to it with their own tile? I mean, yeah, it's all part of the agreement. Yeah. You know, most of the time that's all set up ahead of time. That's the way we like to do it because then we size, you know, for that. So if I'm running a main across a neighbor and I can see that, that he can do some work into it, a lot of times we'll size it for that, kind of set that ahead. But so, w when you're talking repairs, probably our tree roots, I kind of forgot about that, but also grass. Yeah. Um, you get a tile land ran shallow through a road ditch or something, and uh, we've had them definitely plug up with grass. And yeah. yeah, we had that question a lot. Corey and I went to a field day this summer that is working on the watershed project in our area with some saturated, bio reactors. Saturated buffers. Yes. And there, there are a lot of questions around, okay, you're putting this in grass, in a headland. Yeah. You know, in a draw. So what are, what are the likelihood of the grass roots getting down into it? And he was saying that, were they actually socking the whole line? I can't remember what they I said. I can't remember if they did he, he, told, he said, don't worry about it. We got it taken care of, which seemed don't like the political the answer. Paying for it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe sock would, I guess. I guess I'm not sure. Tree, tree roots and grass roots would be, that's what I thought your, what your answer would be. That's our biggest deal. We usually have a tile jetter guy come out and run a hose up it with a high pressure water line and pretty cool what comes out i'm usually pretty careful on the new installs um i'm usually 150 feet for tree roots even on the pattern stuff if there's trees along that fence line i'll run that main out 150 feet mm -hmm. and then i'll pull laterals on the back side up to the tree roots again so so if tree roots are getting in there it's just lateral it's not getting so, into so our when main. you're talking you're pretty careful you mean you're doing like non-perforated tile right, correct yep. yep i'll do non-perf until yep. we're out out that 150 feet so or that so way then the roots can't get in there right yep because we because we have had those so in the notes i just copy and pasted from iowa state university extension office and you pretty much covered everything that they had labeled here you know watch your inlets watch your outlets watch for rodents watch for tree roots grass roots uh so it seems like that that's a pretty common way to make sure that the tile that you've invested in to put in your farm is going to stay effective, you know, and, and continue to drain. But do you know, is there any way to do this type of an inspection in a year right now when it's dry? So it works in a year when it's wet or, or is that just the only way to figure out if your tile is broken, plugged to wait till it rains a lot and it's not draining? Well, that's the easiest, but then the hardest to fix. Yeah. Um, there is, there's some companies around with cameras. And they'll they'll come in and, and run uh, the same guys that are doing your your city sewers. You know, most of your city sewers are getting cameraed, whether it's every five years or three years or whatever it is. So they'll come in and they run a little, it's like a more controlled truck basically. And is they there can any, run up that tile. Is there any way with like NDVI maps and heat signatures and drones mm -hmm. uh, to get the variance in temperature where tile is, or is it too deep that you wouldn't see it? Typically, the only time I've seen where where that works. Um, well, it's, it's the same reason why the, the soil is warmer where we have tile is because there's there's not water there. It's it's replaced by air, you know, so then air warms up I was just faster. wondering if, like, there was a block and you'd be able to see that, but I don't I, – I bet the technology will get there, guys. Right. We'll, we'll go out – so if we have a block tile somewhere and we go out to do a repair, we've got locators and stuff to run up, but most of the time, I, if I know where that tile is because I've got that all GPS, so if it's anything we've done – I'll just dig down to it until I find it. We cut a little slit in it. Most of the time, if it's perforated, you just dig down to it. You get within a foot of it. And if there's water boiling out, it's still plugged. You go one direction. If it's not, you go the other direction. Right. And we just narrow it down that way. We can use you that quicker. So do you just get the hangers out and witch it? <laughs> <laughs> right. okay, maybe not. That's how he does everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. I was just going to make a comment that, you know, those tile cameras might be kind of interesting for your YouTube channel, Zach, but then it also might be really boring if all you're seeing is the inside of black pipe. I was thinking you could strap a GoPro to one of these muskrats yeah. and maybe you could figure out why they go and eat it up that's at the teeth. That's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's pretty good. Well, I don't have anything else on the maintenance question. The only other question that I want to address from a listener, unless you guys have more, is around the value. We talked ROI in the first show. We talked ROI on crop production levels. So how could landlord-tenant relationships work in the long term based upon the anticipated return on investment to the farmer? We didn't talk return on investment to the landlord or the landowner based upon the appreciated value of the land. So that's where I want to head next, unless you've so, got something else And there. we're all farm for profit, so I'm, I'm thinking ahead. Sometimes being profitable is maintenance. 
And so we talked about maintenance. What if something breaks? Then how do we fix it? And we alluded to, is there any way to know, uh, to do maintenance? You, Corey, you just mentioned something that uh, a flushing system, would it behoove us to flush it every year and just make sure? I don't know what that flushing costs, but... Uh, it's usually hourly. Is it, uh, is it something that, how often does something break? I guess that, that's where I should start. Very, especially the new systems, hardly ever. Okay, um, so it wouldn't be worth our while to probably right. do that. It, it would be something in a case where... Um, you know, just the way the lay the land, something got a little shallow in a in a manure tanker, had crushed it, or mm -hmm. or rodent had gotten up from the bottom or the top. But if if you've got your rodent guards in, things like that. So better to be reactive than proactive, maybe on that. But mm -hmm. proactively going forward, if you are the landowner, it might behoove you to put tile in. I think yeah, I would agree, and I would say proactively on the reactive side, if you followed that, I'm sure when it's tree roots and grass roots, it doesn't happen overnight. Correct. So you're probably going to have an idea when you start to get a plug tile. We have enough elevation in our area, too, where it'll actually push it out of the ground. You know, you'll have a wet spot will show up on a side hill and that, you know, where there's a plug or something like that. Yeah, um, so we can go get it sooner rather than later. Correct. Yep. Awesome. Well, Dave, we're going to rely on you a little bit here for this listener's question. And listeners, don't forget, you can keep asking. We may throw this into a what's working in ag segment if you continue to fire questions our way because uh, we certainly want to get to the bottom of this tile topic since it was our most requested one. Dave, just top of your head, starting off, is it worth it to put tile in farm ground if you plan on selling it? There's a break-even point. My saying is, is the juice worth the squeeze? So is the juice worth the squeeze to put tile in? Um, I'd ask how much does it cost to put tile in? If you don't have tile to start with, and it costs you $1,500 an acre to put it in, are you going to reap $1,500 of benefit if you sold it right after that? I'm going to argue no, that you're not. Um, will you get close? Probably. You might get $1,000 an acre more out of the ground. So if it was $7,000 farm ground and you put $1,500 worth of pattern tile, 60-foot 60, 60 centers, you might get $1,000 more an acre. But the guys that I see buying farmland, they want to do that. They're the guys that want to buy it, do a little maintenance. They have their own tile, but they're like you. They have 5,000 acres or something. They do their own, and now it's worth more money. So they made more money because they were the guys that could do the work. I was actually going to do a program with a, a tile guy where we would sell a farm, and we would sell it already pre-tiled. And I already had an agreement with the local tile guy that we would tile it for you. Um, we never did it because you never know how somebody wants it, what they want. So it's like painting a kitchen before you sell the house. Well, what color does the new buyer want? Well, I don't know. That's what, a good point. So, what, what color do they want? We don't know. So how much tile do they want? Uh, did they want to do that? Was it was the juice worth the squeeze to them? But yes, arguably it will make more money for your farm. So long answer. Sorry about that. No, that's the type of answer we're looking for. So if I can kind of split that up a little bit. First, I like the concept that you just shared. So Zach, if you were going to go out and buy a farm and Dave was advertising it as we've got a thousand dollar an acre tile allowance, would you bid more for the farm if you knew there was already a tile guy coming in? Or would you rather have control over what it was going to look like? That's a good question. I think I'd, uh, it would kind of depend on the piece and what I'm looking at and what it really needs. But one of the first things I do if there's a farm for sale in our area is drive over to it, look at it physically or look at it on, on Google Earth, whatever, and try to figure out what I can do to improve it. That's the first thing you're going to look at. Okay, what's the potential of it? Where can I get it to? Right. Yeah, because I, I could see that being a politician type answer. And I have a feeling if, if you continue with the program like that, Dave, you're going to get that from a lot of farmers of, well, I got my own tile guy, or I, I don't want to do it this way. I bet it makes a difference. Yeah, I bet it makes a difference where what land is doing. Like right now, there's a lot of land available and it's high priced. Like, so if it was actually maybe on a downturn and then you had the, the choice between, uh, this ground and this ground right next to each other. One is fully pattern tiled, but you didn't really want to go spend any money, but it was the right, it was a thousand dollars more or $1,500 more, but you'd pay more right for the, for the ones that you didn't have to go do it. I didn't even think about the money side of that guys. That's right. That would be a way that you as the landowner didn't have to pay for the tile until you got paid for the farm. And you can depreciate tile that's already put in, or you can depreciate your own. So if you put it in yourself, then you'll have a longer depreciation period than if somebody did it. 
if we're an investor buyer and we're looking for the tax advantage of it, we might just have have uh, uh, Randy come and put it in and depreciate the value on taxes, and that might be a better better go. So we haven't done that program. We've thought about it, but uh, I thought it was a great advantage because we know uh, from our last podcast that you make 20% more and that bankers will lend on that <laughs> probably possibly around 20% more yield uh, potential out of that farm. So you've heard it here first. If you want to sell your farm and try out Dave's new plan, it's Whitaker Marketing Group. No, I'm kidding. Yes. <laughs> Iowa land guy. Iowa land guy. That's right. <laughs> I should go. get that right. And Randy, right. Randy will write you up a program for $3,000 <laughs> an acre and <laughs> yep. honor some money for you. Yep. <laughs> Correct. Yes. <laughs> so the, the other part of that, that quick little introduction answer that you gave was around, you may not get it all back. And, and I'm going to try to do my best just relating to what you said around uh, home remodels. You know, there's a lot of times that I get loan requests to remodel a master bedroom uh, with a master bath. And then you get the requests about, well, we need to redo the roof. And then we're also going to redo the kitchen. You know, it, it's probably one of those things to where a house is just expected to have a roof. Is a farmland just expected to be well-drained? Good point. Because I've had a lot of people selling houses even. They say, well, we got a brand new roof. We just put eight thousand dollars in it yeah well people expected it not to have a roof that leaks so it was good you know should the farm be expected to produce 200 bushel corn not so much uh every farm is different um unlike every house should have a roof that doesn't leak i think every farm is different some have sandy soil some have clay some have gumbo some have so i don't know what's your guys' thoughts i'm just talking out loud here but uh, i think the baseline's there right like the people that put in the clay tile made it made stuff farmable or not yeah Right, so that's the baseline. That's true. I didn't I don't think expect about that. it to be pattern tiled. I guess. It's There's nice a, a question for our listeners. I want you to comment on social media. Should a farm be expected to have tile on it and all the wet spots be cleaned up? So another <laughs> li another listener had a question, Dave, around uh, what you said in the first show about going to sell the farm and struggling to get a hold of tile maps. So I'm going to start with Randy on what do you do to help the people you tile with keep records? Are you keeping them? for infinity are you making copies How? they'll they'll get a map um and and they can get multiple i've got them on the computers click click and print um so everything's on there the years that it was done the the month that it was done in mm -hmm. um so I, i've got some guys who want the map right away they put it with the uh, um, invoice laminate it and put it with the deed i mean that'll stay there forever you know mm -hmm. there, um, there's a you should start a database with a so like different companies have their own user portals that can log in. If you had a tile portal where the guys could log in and look at any of their maps through a system that you have, not that you want to start your own database, but then what? you'd be the coolest <laughs> tile guy out, the master pipe layer. So you, you should edit that out, not put that out there, <laughs> and, and build get, get a hold of somebody in Silicon Valley and hire them to build it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, we got two weeks. We got yeah. two. <laughs> uh, both of our watersheds actually keep a copy of maps also. Oh, really? Um, so, so when we do a permit, we have to turn in a tile map. We have to turn in a layout, and here's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, their engineers look at it, at, at least Boise to Sioux. So the water goes north, has an engineer that looks at it. Uh, it has to be within a certain coefficient, quarter coefficient, and then, and then they keep that. So they have a, uh, is it GIS? Yeah. Map, so they can pull up any area and see what tile's there mm -hmm. and what has it. I don't know that you can go to them and get that. You so when I search farmland out, I go to the county uh, auditor's office or recorder's office. And if it's been recorded, like you said, the guy takes a laminated copy with the deed and then and goes with. So if it's been recorded, but there are very few farms that have recorded pattern tile. There are a lot of farms that have the county. So a lot of all the county tile or the main uh, uh, drainage districts, they always have something like that at the county. But it's the, oh, we hired you to just fix this one spot. We don't have tiles. So my best is to actually go to GIS systems and look at the past aerial maps for the past 10 years, 20 years, whatever it is. Normally they take them in the fall when all the yep. foliage is off the trees. That's normally when people are doing tile and you oh, can see lines. So I actually look there, but uh, uh, to bring the value, Tanner, one thing to bring the value, I've told people all the time, oh, yep, it's got some tile. They're like, yeah, who cares? They, they don't care because they can't see it unless you have the tile map. So if you're listening and you want more value in your farmland, have to have the tile map. 
get that dial map from your guy, laminate it, keep it. And so when I ask you to sell the farm, do you have copies of that? If we can produce that at 60 foot on center, pattern tiled, square flat, black, beautiful, good drainage, good right. yields, fantastic. Remember, Greg, uh, um, Machine Repeat told mm -hmm. us, tell the story. This is all about telling the story just like uh, uh, Mike Burkhart did with yep. his equipment. So that the best thing that I wrote down when I got this question and I wanted to have an answer prepped was treat it like your will. If you've, if you've gotten advice from an attorney with your will is you put a copy in your lockbox, you put a copy in your house or your, or your home safe, and then you also give a copy to somebody else that you trust. So listeners, every time that you have an answer and it's random from me, but it's like perfectly scripted from Tanner, you just heard it. He prepares all of his answers <laughs> and I just have to do them off the cuff. Sorry, I digress. Nope. Keep going. No, but but I, like, I like the idea of putting it with the deed because then no matter who owns the property, it could be exchanged hands three or four times. Right. They've got it. With that, I would I would say probably seventy percent of them have it in a file cabinet somewhere. They stepped on it, and you know they, they don't have it. But I get uh, quite often I get requests, you know, for their for their layout to see their layout or or what's been done. So there. if if Randy's ever not the Pat Master Pipe Layer anymore, how are they going to get their maps? Good question. Uh, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean that computer will be somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, or if it's in their file, Tanner. Most of the people I sell for are the kids that no longer farm somebody right. passed away that had it in a file cabinet somewhere in their house full of stuff mm -hmm. along with every magnet from every company and thing they've ever got that the kids throw away so i don't know that there is a spot but if you had a spot for just your farmland records wouldn't be a bad idea yep well good i Corey, do you have any more questions before we wrap up i was just going to make a general comment on tile maps the best ones that i we always get are the handwritten in pencil you can tell they had like a, a <laughs> on a ruler grid. they had, had a ruler and they on a grid you know, paper yeah, yeah right. a straight line yeah they do so that are you up making fun of my system <laughs> <laughs> the well, the contractor went to the bar at the end of the day and sat down over a beer and drew those lines in i think we put two here yeah yeah, yeah about 150 feet is that right. five inch or is that eight inch? i can't tell <laughs> right Tanner, that's how, that's I got a question. Heavy, heavy weight the lead was in his pencil. I got a question for you. Um, so I, I'm Zach. I'm I'm Corey, and I want to. I'm thinking about mm -hmm. putting tile in something. I might even have a little tax money. Okay, so we're coming up on uh, tax time. We just finished last year. We got good grain in our bins, uh, better than expected yields, and now I might have a little uh, extra cash to put in. But I don't have enough. I don't have enough to pay Randy. To put this uh, to put this pipe in, what uh, what what is it going to cost me? What is there an average? I have no idea. What is an average? Do I borrow money on this? Is it just like buying a house at two and a half, three percent, or where yep. are we at? How do we do that? Yeah, the political answer is it depends, and it depends upon how you want to structure the repayment. If you're wanting to pay for this over the 15 year life or longer of this, then we're gonna have to treat it like a real estate loan. So we we'll, can amortize it over 15 years. You can. So we will always base a loan off the useful life of the asset that you're purchasing it with. So that's either the collateral that you're using or where it's going to be put in. So if you're going to treat this like a land note and give us access to the abstract, we can put a mortgage on the property, we could amortize this over 15 years. So let me back up. You you told us in the first episode that we were thinking 20% was the number mm -hmm. and bankers were okay with loaning that. Mm -hmm. If you if Corey wanted to buy a farm or Zach wanted to buy a farm and they came to you to borrow money and they said, I want to buy this farm, but I, I'm, I just saw that it can be improved. Mm -hmm. And I already talked with Randy and I, before the auction, I already figured out I can put this much tile in. I think the yields will be this much better. Can they group that loan together? Yes. They can. Yep. So we could put that together. Same thing goes if you anticipate a faster return than the 15 years I just shot out, we can put it on a shorter term loan and don't even have to use the real estate as collateral. So there's a chance that if you want to pay this back over five years, we could go either unsecured or with a different type of security for your project. So it all depends upon how aggressive you want to be on the repayment side. And then both of those answers I give are going to depend, make your interest rate depend. Is so, there is there a minimum? Um, let's say I'm a smaller farmer. I got uh, just a short 160 or something and 40 of it needs tile. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a huge project. Mm -hmm. Is there a minimum uh, that that it takes to be a tile project? This is for Randy or Tanner. I mean, is there is there a minimum that I need at least fifty thousand dollars to make to make it worth it? No, I would just give the pure blanket answer: is any smaller loan in the banking world is going to be priced higher. 
because it takes the same amount of time to put together a set of loan docs for fifteen grand as it does for one hundred and fifty thousand, as it does for one point five million. So it might be better to tile the whole blooming thing. You would potentially get better pricing on the banking side for borrowing more dollars at one time if you can qualify. And Randy, it. does it cost more to to tile just a short? So, I mean, it's time I mean, is time. We might pull in and do a thousand feet somewhere. Okay, you know, a guy needs one little run here or, or there. So then, yeah, it has to. I mean, I gotta I gotta move in, you know, to do that. I still need the equipment there. But that becomes a summer job. So we gotcha. do those jobs in the crowd. <laughs> so now you got me asking, okay, so I'm uh, a farmer. I've decided I'm going to buy this farm. I I saw improvements. I was Zach. I was super proactive. I looked at it and I decided I'm going to add tile to this. I can roll it all in the same because I heard on Farm for Profit podcast that we can do this. What do you want as a banker? What do I need to bring to you? Do I bring randy's tile plan already do i already need that done or do i just come to you and give you my idea or would you would i be better as a farmer to come to the bank or prepared and how do i come prepared yeah so i i might be different than others i would appreciate being your first or second stop on the conversation i would want to know that you're thinking about putting tile in and you can ask then we can work together on a plan for how much we think you can financially afford because it's not going to be infinite even though the return on investments there not every person, not every farmer is going to be able to qualify for the same amount of additional capital. So I would like to be one of the first two stops to get a figure. Then you go talk to Randy and you say, Randy, I've got a $60,000 budget. I'd like to attack this 80. Or Randy, I've got a $300,000 budget. I'd like to attack my farm. Where should we start? That would be my preference. And maybe Randy's got something different to say. How much do uh, taxes go into that? Maybe the CPA should be in there too. Yeah. Uh, I, think I, I mean, for depreciation schedules. Right. When we talked with, um, now I can't remember the name of the doctors uh, that we did about our tax episode. Fauci? Yeah. Uh, no, what about Fauci? We don't talk to either one of those guys. <laughs> not, not, not the kind of content we get value out of on this podcast. But, but when we talked to uh, about the tax plan, and I mentioned that I had a love-hate relationship with Section 179. Yep. This would be uh, the ability to get a better return on investment than some purchases that people are financing, farmers are financing for in order to get the 179 deduction the CPA is offering. So I would say, sure, you can include the CPA if it's going to be the end of the year tax decision. I would just ask that you give us all time and, and Randy's hopefully going to agree to that. The more time, the better. Randy, did you have anybody give you money before the end of the year for tax, uh, tax purposes? Don't no. throw anybody under I, the bus. Say no. Don't throw. <laughs> you don't have to say names. Ix nay on the oopit stand. But we we typically so uh, we also run. We have an egg service there also. So we we have shop work, uh, blacksmith shop. Um, we do chemical, custom spraying. Okay. So, so we'll we'll commonly get a few of our prepays. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. they'll drop in and drop fifty thousand dollars. You know, it'll go to it'll go to chemical shop work tile. Yep. Mm-hmm. Not sure, but they just needed to dump a little money for prepays. Yep. We talked mm-hmm. about that. Other ways to make money uh, other than farming or aside from the farming job. Yep. No, that's good. Corey, do you have any more questions? Oh, that's it. Did you take notes this time? I didn't. Okay. So, uh, I, no? I was just going to add one more thing for the, for the lending part. So I don't know if you covered this on the first one or not, but as a landlord and a renter, a lot of times our, the renter will pay a fair amount of that tile for a mm-hmm. five or 10 year lease. Um, so we did. We talked okay. about expanding the lease out um, and getting a long-term lease or having a buyout proration if, if it cost X amount of dollars and then somebody un- underbid you and they, they sold or got that rented that contract out after uh, um, you know a year or something that you just have a prorated. Correct. Yeah. Yep. That's typically what, what we'll see. And we'll, we'll see those drawn up quite often, um, something like that. We've actually been able to work with some of our landlords, you know, when it comes to times like this and rental prices are going up. Yep. And they'll come to us and, and, and want up the rent, which is a fair discussion to have. And, and we'll actually, you know, a lot of times they want to improve the land too. Mm-hmm. So we'll pay for a tile job, say, hey, we'll cover this amount of dollars in, in drain tile and we'll handle the whole thing as long as we can sign a three or five or, you know, yeah. usually five is about as far as we want to go. Do a five year contract at the price that it is today then they get the benefit of that tile. It's in their soil and we get the benefit of it over the next five right, years. Raising the crop. Right. Absolutely. So listeners, we answered the questions or we asked and hopefully answered the questions that we have uh, presented so far. I know since this was such a highly requested topic that there's going to be some more that come out and that's fine uh, because we could get Randy back on the phone. We could get somebody else back on the phone and get a what's working in ag segment to pound out a couple of these. So don't hesitate to ask those if they come to your mind. Uh, whether that's through social media channels or through our email. We typically ask every one of our guests 
the same question at the end of our shows, but we're not going to ask it today. No. Because listeners, if you stick around for another week, we're going to roll into a farm for fun show with these guys and get to know them a little bit better. And we will uh, get the creative juices flowing uh, with some, what do you call it? Aiming fluid, some, some thinking juice, some... <laughs> Get some, get I, some, Iowa corn water. Iowa heard. corn water. Yes. Uh huh. Get well, some corn water. Flowing. Maybe if we're not asking them the question, they could give a challenge to people that are thinking about tile. Okay. And uh, if you want, I'll summarize. Yep. You take after the summary. And if you, if we always like to challenge our listeners to either put them outside of their comfort zone or to get them to take the next step with their farm. Uh, so if you think about something like that after Dave gets done, we'd appreciate it. So listeners, today this is uh, part two of our most uh, number one most requested topic, and that's drain tile. Um, we started uh, number two here today with just a little refresher what we talked about in part one, and that is what is drain tile, a system of pipes. We talked about field tile, the difference in, in uh, double walled, single walled. We talked about outlets. We talked about inlets. We talked about shape. Um, why do we need drain tile? The purpose of surface drainage and, and uh, flooding rivers and, and runoff, whatnot. And then we also talked about yield potential and major reasons for installing subsurface drain tile. We talked about tile as being a necessity on farmland. Uh, we talked about returns that we could get off at various types of tiling patterns, everything from herringbone to parallel to double main. There's a lot of different systems that uh, we went over. So uh, if you're at the end of the episode or if you just fast forwarded, you're, you're getting all this at the end. But we talked about different types of uh, in, in season or not season one, but uh, I'm thinking of Yellowstone there. But <laughs> in, in part one, in part one, we talked about various uh, insulation methods from plows, trenchers, excavators and, and how you do it. We talked about GPS. Um, Today, we brought up a couple concerns with COVID-19 supply issues and, and what that might look like for costs and how much they went up. Uh, one thing we big or we talked about a little more in detail was maintenance of drain tile today. Everything from inspection, cleanouts in the ditches, uh, surface inlets, uh, repairing blowouts, uh, 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 project drain outlets, et cetera, et cetera. Even uh, animals getting up and turning around in the tees. Uh, and then we kind of concluded here with, uh, will it increase value of farmland? Uh, yes or no. And I didn't want to be negative on that. So I wanted to make sure I got the summary today. Um, it definitely increases <laughs> the value of your farmland. Will it increase it enough that you'll see the return immediately? No. Long run, yes. Wholeheartedly, yes, yes, yes. And I don't know if I made that clear enough uh, before. And then we talked about the investment structure and how you get into getting farmland uh, with drain tile or adding drain tile to your farmland and what you might need or thoughts to think about when going to the bank. Other than that, that's drain tile. I like it. Does that give you guys enough time to come up with a challenge? Uh, so what? <laughs> <laughs> well played. Permits. Okay. That's, uh, it's harder in areas, some areas than others, but uh, uh, permits is a, is a, big, is a big one. Mm -hmm. um, knowing, knowing what easements are on your land, uh, there's a lot of fish and wildlife easements out there that were put on in the 50s that guys don't even realize they've had. Right. And some of them we've been into and have had to fix. Wetlands. We talked that about that a, last time. Wetlands, and it's your responsibility as the uh, as landowner. The owner, yep. Correct. Yep. No. Oh. Very good. Zach, do you have anything to add? No, I don't, I don't think I have anything real deep when it comes to that. Okay. You know, like he said, if you got to get on permits, every farmer knows, you know where those spots are in your fields that yeah. probably could use some tile, right? So, I mean, we, we all know where that's at. If you're interested, I, I guess I would say call whoever's in your area that does it mm -hmm. or, or talk to the neighbor that's done it, you know, and just yep. find out, you know, go from there, talk to people. Perfect. Last question before we close out is, are you guys going to the National Farm Machinery Show this year down in Louisville? I am not. I'm not either. I don't remember what, but I've got something else going on. All right. Well, if you were, we'd tell you to come find us at the Sioux Cup booth. So we are proud to announce that we will be down there for Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and we will be with Sioux Cup Manufacturing. So uh, for listeners, if you want to come find us and hang out, we'll be there for most of the day. And one more thing, how do we find you guys? I know you've got a great podcast as well. Tell us uh, just a little plug for your podcast and then also uh, um, how to get in contact with you. Uh, we, yeah, we've got Off the Husk podcast that we do together um, in my basement. It's very, very fancy. There's uh, gymnastics equipment everywhere and hockey stuff from the kids. But we do the Off the Husk podcast there, kind of you know similar to what you guys are doing with uh, Farm for Fun podcast. And uh, we're both on social media. You can find me anywhere at Millennial Farmer and Randy at 
Master Pipe Master Player. Master Pipe Player. Master Pipe Player. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it being a part of our part two. Uh, Zach, for tagging along. We appreciate that as well. In the so, audience. Uh -huh. You're welcome. The grandstanding. <laughs> the grandstanding. <laughs> and listeners, until next time, we'll talk to you then. Remember, if you aren't farming for profit, you won't be farming for long.